This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time. Content presented in the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the host and guest and may not represent the views and opinions of the Whole Care Network. Always consult with your physician for any medical advice and always consult with your attorney for any legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. It's one of these things a lot of people don't think about advanced care planning before they hit their 60s or their 70s. And you got to look at your lifestyle. It's just being realistic. And we all have that kind of stuff. And even if you're not engaged in sport, just think of how many car accidents happen every day. Even the safest driver can get hit by a terrible driver. So it's not just an old thing. It's not just a uh, serious disease thing. It's not a chronic disease thing. It's a human thing. This is the Heart of Hospice podcast with Helen Bauer. Today's guest is Nathan Kotkamp, the founder of National Healthcare Decisions Day. Whether you're a family caregiver or an end-of-life professional, the Heart of Hospice is here to enhance your hospice experience by connecting you with information you can use about end-of-life care. As a caregiver, you want comfort and dignity for your patient and convenience for yourself. The Quick Change Wrap offers all of that with a life-changing way to address male incontinence. It folds around the source of urine and wicks it away, protecting surrounding skin, clothing, and bedding. Use the Quick Change by itself or with an adult diaper for superior protection. A single caregiver can quickly change the wrap with no lifting or turning the patient. 800 hospitals use it. Now you can get it at home. Visit quickchange.com now. Now here's today's episode. Nathan Kotkamp was a fantastic guest, not just because he's warm and extremely knowledgeable, but he's doing work that's so vital and it dovetails with what we do in end-of-life care. Nathan Kotkamp is a prolific writer. He's a speaker on a wide array of legal and ethical topics, including HIPAA, which is privacy in healthcare language, digital health, and ransomware. He is also the founder and chair of National Healthcare Decisions Day, which highlights the importance of advanced care planning. On a personal note, Nathan is a master's level cyclist racing both road and mountain bikes. Nathan is so knowledgeable, and the fact that he has been such um, a loud, consistent, advocating voice for advanced care planning is just amazing. We could have talked for another hour, I think, about advanced care planning. Um, I love it that he shared some of his personal story. You'll get to hear that as well. Starting up National Healthcare Decisions Day in 2008, after growing it as a state program, smaller in the state of Virginia, and then taking it across the United States, what a huge accomplishment. I, I don't think I told him that. I probably should have. But what a huge thing to develop a national conversation about end-of-life wishes, because that's what it is. He's even talking about maybe the word healthcare decisions isn't the most accurate title for the day, and they may move to something else that's a little more comprehensive. You know, human decisions, quality of life decisions, you know, there there's so many things to think about. But before I give away the whole interview, here's my conversation with Nathan Kotkamp. Nathan, welcome to the podcast. I'm so glad to get to know you today. Helen, thanks so much. We're going to jump in. You, you're an overachiever, Nathan, 
in my eyes. I've read your bio. I know all the stuff you do. You're a cyclist. You're an attorney. And you are definitely one of the most vocal advocates for advanced care planning in the United States, so much so that you founded the Virginia Advanced Directives Day back in 2006, and then you took it nationally across the United States as National Health Care Decisions Day in 2008. What was your impetus for getting started with the Virginia Directives Day? So it all started in college. I have a master's in bioethics that came after studying ethics at the College of William Mary, and I got to see all sorts of different things, but I had an internship um, with an end-of-life group in New York, and I don't recall the specifics, but we had this one day where we set up this little table in the lobby, and we were handing out advanced directives forms, and you know, we probably handed out about 20 or something like that, but that it sort of sparked something, and when I went into practice as a lawyer, one of the very first things I did was reach out to local hospitals and said, hey, I've got an ethics degree. I love this stuff. I'll sit in your ethics committee for no charge. Will you have me? And they were like, of course we will. And almost every meeting involved some discussion of a terrible case that almost always included no discussion of end of life planning, no advanced directives. And it was just this broken record issue. And it was starting to annoy me quite frankly. And this was right as Terry Shiva was was unfolding as well. And so I originally conceived of the Advanced Directive Day as technically a compliance initiative because there's federal law that requires hospitals to ask patients about advanced directives and actually then educate the public about them. And I knew that my clients weren't doing it. I knew that the hospitals across town weren't doing it. And so I said, well, why don't we just do a giant across the state compliance day, um, which we did. We had 100% of the hospitals in Virginia participate two years in a row. And at that point, I could have tried to do the same thing with nursing homes and hospices and things like that, but that would have been like herding cats. And so instead, I said, we've got this great model. Let's try and take it nationally. And I was just in the right place at the right time. Um, I didn't have a stake in the matter. So a lot of the big organizations have a little bit of turf battling that goes on about this topic. And so for this um, totally new young attorney with this idealistic vision of what we could do, people are like, all right, we'll give it a shot. And here we are with National Healthcare Decisions Day on April 16. And we are over a decade in the running and it's getting better and better every year. That's awesome. We love participating in it. It's great conversation. I, I love it that it's a, a prompt for everybody to normalize these conversations. Yeah. I, uh, Helen, let me let me mention this, though, because I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this. Um, note the distinction between where it started and where it is today. We started as Virginia Advanced Directives Day, and we're now at National Healthcare Decisions Day. And part of that shift is that, again, I was younger and more naive. I was a new lawyer. I thought laws and rules and everything were the way to go. Um, so the, the very first two years were very focused on the document. And when we took it national, we tried to, to be very, very strategic about stepping back from the documents and getting more into the concept of the process being important. So you know, worst case scenario is you have nothing at all. Next, less worst case scenario is you have a conversation, but you never put it in writing. At least that is better than nothing at all. So even that is something that we think happens on National Healthcare Decisions Day just because of the prompt. We'd like it to go a step further, but we figure that incremental should be considered success. Success does not mean only having a document. I like that. We've talked about that on the podcast before, because I think when it comes to being a, an end of life professional, a hospice professional, a lot of times the interventions we provide when it comes to advanced directive conversations is to get a medical power of attorney. And in the state of Texas, a DNR, which is a very simple one page document. And then we're good. I call them the big basics. It's the stuff that makes the hospice care easier. 
we don't really focus on the rest of that stuff. Sometimes there's not enough time. Sometimes, you know, there are hundreds of reasons why a family or a, a, a caregiver doesn't want to have those conversations or a patient doesn't want to have that conversation. But a lot of times those documents are completed for the convenience of the hospice agency to make it clean, make it clear. This person's going to make the decision and we don't want CPR. We don't always go beyond that. But what we know about healthcare decisions is it's a huge topic that's way more than just those two documents. People can have spiritual care directives. They can, um, they need to have conversations about memorial service, funeral services, disposition of the body, the caregiving situation at the end of life, all those sorts of things. So that's great that there is a comprehensive concept around having an advanced directive, a, a healthcare directive conversation. I think that's really important. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think the the, the place that we sometimes um, stumble with advanced care planning is the notion that it's really um, healthcare decision focused in the realm of like, hey, I want this and I want that and I wouldn't want this and here's the, the number of days I want to do a trial of that drug. We, we decide that it's not good enough. And I think when we when we get that granular, we miss the point in a lot of cases, which is tell me what kind of person you are. And we, we talk about person-centered care. I would prefer an advanced directive to tell me what the person is. Give me like your core pillars of your personality. And from that, I think I can probably direct care in an appropriate way. From my perspective, and I'm always being asked, which is better to have a uh, an agent or a proxy or a surrogate, whatever uh, it's called in your particular state, to have that declared or to have a, a set of written instructions. Obviously, being where I am, I would prefer that people have both. But I have seen far too many really sad situations where there's multiple family members and they can't agree or there isn't any family members. And despite the fact that there are other people in that person's life. and. I take the position with no way of ever being able to substantiate this, but it's just my strong gut that if someone were to identify the right person for them, and everybody is going to define the right person in a different way, but if you identify the right person for you and you never even talk at all about your healthcare choices, I am convinced that the right person will make the right choice the vast majority of the time. And no, it may not be perfect, but so many times we don't even have that because we're left with no list of the right person. And that's easy to fix. I think you've hit on something really important because this is an uphill battle. We've been having this conversation for years to get people to have end of life, healthcare decision conversations with us, advanced care planning conversations. And if you have the right person, they can do it without any of that documentation and possibly without a discussion. That's right. I, I have a personal experience doing that for a friend. And she and I never had those conversations. She actually made me her medical power of attorney legally. But when her health took a turn to where she could no longer be a voice for her own care, I was flying blind because she and I had never talked any sort of details. What I did was make decisions based on the way she had lived her life and what I knew about her. And I really felt like looking back on the whole thing, I don't have a lot of regrets about how I handled it. But I, I pretty much made every decision based on just what I knew about her. And with the guidance of her healthcare team, obviously, to let me know that she was terminally ill, that sort of thing. But basically making the decisions based on what I knew about her and who she was. And I think a lot of people have to do that. I think that's right. But in so many cases, there are multiple contenders for that role. And without instruction, you just end up with a potential for a mess. And um, that's why if I could wave my magic wand... Now, I'm only going to talk about hospitals here for just a moment, but if I could wave my magic wand, 100% of every inpatient would have at least a named decision maker on their chart within two hours of admission. Every patient, every time. 
even the most benign procedure can actually be life-threatening. I mean, if you have somebody starting an IV, that can throw a clot. Someone can die from an IV. And you're like, oh, that's just such a simple thing. Yeah, it is simple, which is why. And when patients start to get worried about the fact that why are you asking me about a decision maker? Do you think I'm going to get, you know, you think I'm going to end up unconscious because I'm here because of a, you know, a stubbed toe or a broken leg or whatever? Say, so no, we ask this of every patient every single time. It's just what we do. And if we do that, we take away the stigma. Right. But right now we make such a big deal out of it. It becomes artificially important. And because of the artificial importance of it, it freaks people out and they're reluctant to do it. When you have multiple possibilities or multiple candidates for designating as your spokesperson, I I think that can cause some, some strife in the family. You know, if there's not a legally designated, like a legal spouse, right, which is a whole lot easier to identify for a person, um, but to pick among six children or siblings, or if you're a solo ager choosing a friend, I think it can cause some some anxiety and some some angst on the part of the person who's having to choose. So those conversations are, just make it it just makes it a little bit more difficult to choose. When you were sitting as an ethics committee member, what were some of the most challenging things you saw families having to deal with and the healthcare teams having to deal with? Well, the worst ones were families in dispute where there was no instruction whatsoever. Um, And everyone's got a different perspective. And it's usually, it's almost always never two decisions or two competing decisions. opinions. It's usually three or four, and nobody can agree upon anything. Um, Occasionally, I've seen some, which is sort of a different uh, variation on that same thing, where there is a directive, and there's a disagreement about what it means, or there's an advanced directive, and there are um, concerns that the individual didn't have capacity when they made it or that they were manipulated or that they have a substance issue. And so how can we really trust this? Um, Those are the common ones that we would see on a regular basis, but the others were sort of the next step down the line where, because there was an advanced directive, there was more, um, I don't know how you describe it, but there was more concern the decision making, particularly end of life decision making, particularly removal of various uh, treatment, artificial nutrition, hydration, things like that, when there aren't instructions, even when it is obvious that it would be the right thing to do clinically, it just makes it that much harder for the people to do it because you have this inertia problem and there's this notion that removing something is inherently bad. And so without a document that gives people the permission to do that, if you will. Um, those were the ones that, that made things really tough. I can imagine you've seen some, some pretty challenging situations. Yeah. Well, let me share what I think is one of the, just the, the it's almost pathetic, this case that I saw. It was a woman and she was in her mid thirties, uh, recently divorced, had a, a child who was uh, nine years old, something like that. Uh, certainly couldn't be participating in decision-making. She was traveling through Richmond. She lived about an hour away with a friend of hers because, again, recently divorced, didn't have a whole lot of money. Undoubtedly, that friend would have been the right person for her decision-making if it weren't parent or something like that. And this lady came in just with some abdominal pain. It was She didn't know what it was. She goes to the emergency room, and about seven or eight hours later, she's having major abdominal surgery. And she was that fraction of a percent of healthy, relatively young people who had a really bad outcome. So she was uh, she was then in a coma. And I ended up having to go to a judge to get court ordered treatment because we didn't have a decision maker. The woman that she was living with, who, again, was living an hour away, ended up being appointed as her guardian. But that took a bunch of time through the court system to be formally appointed as the guardian. So $100,000 in legal fees, two different law firms, got the judges involved. So we're using all sorts of public resources that 
could have been completely eliminated with about a two minute conversation because I, I guarantee you they asked her her marital status and she says, I'm not married. Then the next question is, well, do you have a decision maker? And the notion that someone would go into major abdominal surgery without an advanced directive and he had eight hours to do this. It's just it, it those types of cases show where the system breaks down in the most horrific ways where it's also so simple to fix it. I agree. A simple conversation. You know, what I've noticed and what we know, evidence-based studies talking to healthcare professionals in the hospital, social workers, nurses, nurse practitioners, is it's one of those, everybody's job is nobody's job. And the conversations don't get started. We don't have time. We don't have the training. And we don't have good comprehensive places to to intuitively document those conversations. And I think a lot of times we just avoid that. So when you have a bucket of mud, the mud settles to the bottom. But when you start stirring it to see what's in there, the mud rises to the top and the, you know, the water gets yucky. And I think a lot of times we don't want to stir all that because we don't have time to do it. And it's easy to leave the status quo the way it is. Okay, so she's having major surgery, but tons of 30-year-old people have come through major surgery and never needed a proxy, never needed a healthcare decision maker. So maybe we shouldn't worry about this so much. True, but and I think it, it also shows um, where we are with some of our priorities. You know, we, in, in healthcare, there's a lot of whack-a-mole sort of stuff that different things pop up at different times. Um, one other anecdote that I'll, I'll share is one, this happened at a hospital um, where I actually was a member of the medical, uh, the ethics committee. I was having abdominal pain. I went into the ER at three o'clock in the morning. And um, so I'm, I'm doing all the, the onboarding stuff with the intake nurse. And I remember her, I mean, she was like visibly disturbed to have to ask about my mental health status. She's like, are you safe? This and that. And that was one of those new protocols that they were asking every patient every time about mental health issues. And she never asked about my advanced directive. And now I'm a huge advocate of mental health issues too, but let's just talk about the reality of the situation, which is the mortality rate of human beings is hundred percent. Mental health issues are somewhere around 20%. So here it is. She's really uncomfortable about asking something, and she does it anyway, about 20% of the population and doesn't ask the thing that pertains to every single human being. So the disconnect between those is just, it's absurd, and it's frankly inexcusable. It doesn't take that much more to add the healthcare decision question after you've just asked me about suicide. Exactly. Probably makes the suicide question easier to ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, if you look at nursing school, of course, I went to nursing school a long time ago. All of us had to go through labor and delivery. It was a mandatory required class. Not all of the population has a baby. Everybody dies. I did not have a class on death and dying and end of life care. It's amazing, isn't it? It's upside down. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. You're right. There's a huge disconnect there. Um, I find it interesting that she would be uncomfortable about those mental health questions and completely ignore the advanced directive question. Yeah. That's so crazy. Oh, it was amazing. Like I could, I could see her squirming. And of course, I'm sort of, I, I'm playing like bingo, admission bingo, because I'm also a lawyer that works on their policies and procedures. And I'm like, all right, when's the advanced directive question going to come? It just never came. And I'm thinking, this is, this is wild. As a solo caregiver for an adult male suffering with incontinence, the nightly interruption of a bedding and clothing change ensures that nobody gets a good night's sleep. Well, now with a quick change wrap, you can make that change quickly with no lifting, turning, or rolling over. It takes just a couple of minutes, then you're both back to sleep. In fact, there's hardly any disruption to your male patient. He doesn't even have to be awake. The quick change wrap folds around the source of urine and wicks it away, protecting surrounding skin, clothing, and bedding. 
the quick change incontinence wrap that is so effective and convenient it will change the way you provide care to your male patient for the better. Combine the quick change wrap with an adult diaper for superior protection. It takes just a minute or two for one person to change the quick change wrap regardless of size, anatomy, or weight of the patient. 800 hospitals use it. Now you can get it at home. Visit quickchange.com now. So let's talk about your advanced directive. So I read in your bio that you wrote your first advanced directive when you were 20 years old, wrote it for yourself. Um, I I don't know how old you are now, so I'll do respect. I'm assuming it's been a few years. (laughs) Yeah, it's been a long time. Have you changed it since that first edition, that first edit you wrote when you were 20? Uh, yes, uh, substantially. So the backstory is, again, I was studying ethics. I had a uh, summer internship with a regional um, end-of-life support group, if you will. Um, and so it was one of these things where I felt like, here's I'm doing the work and educating others about it. And yes, I'm 20 years old, but you know I can get struck by my bus just as well as anybody else can. So it's not just a, a question of cancer and stroke and Alzheimer's and things like that. Um, so undoubtedly, my first advanced directive designated my parents as decision maker, which they would have been anyway um, under the default, which is the, the case in just about every state. Um, but I did provide some instructions to them. And um, you know I can't remember what the detail was, but there were some instructions and now I'm married and have kids. And so I've named my wife, even though she's the default, but that way I have something there. Um, there are some specifics that I have from various life experience where I've, I've said, I don't ever want to go to that facility. So like, that's the extent of what my advanced directive says. And otherwise I trust my wife to know what is going to be the best decision for me be based on 25 years of marriage. So, um, and again, that goes back to my notion that if you have the right decision maker, they're probably going to make the right decision for you the vast majority of the time. And I and I trust my wife to do that. So when you did that first iteration, when you were 20 and your parents were designated as your decision makers, did you sit down and have conversations with them about what you wanted? Yes. How did they take that? Oh, great. Well, well see, um, the other part of the backstory is my mom's a midwife. Uh, and my father's a professor. And so they were sort of primed in a way to have that conversation that most parents probably aren't. Um, but, you know, they were grateful for it. They thought it was great. And I think part of where I am today goes back to that conversation. They didn't, they treated it as something normal. They're like, yeah, our son's studying ethics. Of course, he's going to talk to us about end of life care. And, um, and that's the way it should have been. It shouldn't have been this like momentous, like, oh my gosh, we need to like schedule time. And this is, you know, we're all going to be upset. We're going to hug it out and we're all done because, oh, I can't imagine when you're gone. It's like, look, it's going to happen to all of us. I got a stake in the game. I'm going to tell you what I want. And God willing, we don't have to implement it. But if it's there, if we have it, so be it. And you, you mentioned that I'm a cyclist and it's one of these things that, you know, I talk with my wife about this all the time that if I get struck down while riding my bike, that's okay. I'm out doing what I absolutely love. But in my, you know, thirties and forties, I'm just statistically as a cyclist, more likely to get hit by a car than the average person. And if I don't die, I could end up unconscious and may have decisions to be made about about me. So it's one of these things a lot of people don't think about advanced care planning before they hit their 60s or their 70s. And you got to look at your lifestyle. And again, it's not I'm not reckless when I'm out there. It's just it's just being realistic. And we all have that kind of stuff. And even if you're not engaged in sport, just think of how many car accidents happen every day. Even the safest driver can get hit by a terrible driver. So it's not just an old thing. It's not just a uh, serious disease thing. It's not a chronic disease thing. It's a human thing. So do you think that a lot of people wait until that first healthcare crisis, something, you know, as we age in our 50s and into our 60s, do you think that they don't really feel a push to do any advanced care planning 
until they have some sort of healthcare crisis? That is a very common uh, reaction to advanced care planning. I think the other is just um, a misguided notion about what advanced care planning does and can do. So again, there's this notion, I think, among the general population that you need to be giving specific healthcare instructions in an advanced directive. So that jumps sort of over several steps and it ignores the decision maker. It ignores just what kind of life do you lead? What would, you know, what does being healthy mean to you? You know, are you the type that you want to stay alive at all costs or is life only meaningful for you if you can be walking and talking, interacting in your own home and anywhere in between? So if you, if you look at it as though you're supposed to be giving instructions for a particular disease or situation and you don't have that yet, well, you feel like it's not the right time to do your advanced care plan. But if if it's like, look, what, what do you do if walking out the door, you get hit by a bus, which chances are low, but it's not impossible. And so let's have a plan. And so I think part of it is we've made it harder on ourselves than we should have. Um, one of the one of the things I will readily admit as a lawyer that it's my own uh, peers that have made part of the process terrible. Um, we've turned what it would should just be the most basic kind of conversation into this big legal formality. And yes, I'm talking to all you states out there that have a witnessing requirement that requires a notary and all the rest of this stuff. I mean, come on, it's a basic human thing to say, who's your person? Who's your decision maker? And we put up these blocks with who's allowed to be a witness. You must have a notary. It's got to be this or that. And it's got to have this language. There's a one of the states, I can't remember, has a two page statutorily required introduction that if you don't include that with the advanced directive, it's not valid in that state. Really? Wow. I mean, come on. Yeah. I've always been a little bit amazed that in Texas, the DNR form that we have is actually a one page form, which is unheard of in healthcare, right? We have pages of everything, yeah. right? That you have to sign and all these extra things that come with it. But that silly DNR, that's so intimidating. And I know because I have signed one for someone else is a one page form. Yeah. And sometimes I think that's about how much attention we give to it in healthcare. You know, we don't bother to really talk to people about about what that form means to them. I, I want to switch gears just a little bit and let's talk about an article that came out in 2021. It was a group of physicians that their viewpoint is that advanced care planning doesn't improve end of life care and that the documents that we have, the documentation of that does not work as a reliable indicator of end of life discussions. It, it really goes against the grain of what we talk about in healthcare, and of course, what we talk about for health, National Healthcare Decisions Day. And, and I know you've read the article. What are your thoughts on that particular viewpoint about advanced care planning? Um, I really struggle with it. If you find that article, you'll see that I'm one of about a dozen folks who posted a uh, formal reply in uh, JAMA about it. And the biggest things that I think are flawed in that article is, first of all, a conflation of what the various types of advanced care planning are and what they do. I think they are criticizing, I think they're trying to criticize advanced directives, also known as living wills, and they advocate naming a decision maker, but the reality is those are all forms of advanced care planning. So they're criticizing something probably using the wrong term. That's criticism number one, and it's a big one. I mean, if you're not, if we're not aligned on what you're criticizing, then it's very hard to react to it. The other thing that that I think is more problematic about it is they don't offer any solution, which is a huge deal. I mean, if you're going to criticize advanced care planning, and you're recommend that people not do it, what is your answer for the person who? has a crisis, has no one to make decisions for. I think we've, you know, we've addressed the question of medical paternalism. We've said, no, we don't want that. 
So, and they're not advocating for that. So the question is, what do you, what do you want in the meantime? My position on the whole thing, and again, this is something that there's no way that I can prove this other than based on my experience. I don't think it's appropriate at this point to criticize advanced care plans and advanced care planning and advanced directives, living wills specifically, until we've actually done the work to implement them. The problem is we have this wonderful, or at least potentially wonderful tool that we leave in the toolbox. And when we finally do pick it up for that fraction of patients, why in the world are we surprised when it doesn't work very well? Because we're not training on it, we're not implementing it. So my gut feeling is they're criticizing advanced care planning without focusing on the process to see if it works in the first place. And so until that day comes when every patient who's admitted to a hospital has a decision maker named, and when the vast majority of them have a advanced directive with specific instructions, then we can evaluate whether or not these things are effective or not. But when a guy who's in his 40s rolls into the ER at two o'clock in the morning, I mean, I could have been dead an hour later. They didn't know what I was there for. They assumed it was something relatively, you know, painful but benign because here I am walking in like a healthy 40-year-old. But that's inexcusable. So the criticism about advanced care planning and advanced directives being imperfect is just, it's misplaced at the moment. I'm happy to have the, the dialogue about whether or not we can improve upon them after we've given them a better shot. But I just don't think we're there yet. I think it's too early to say that the, the process is bad, at least without offering a solution or an alternative. So I guess I have a, a multi-pronged criticism of that article. Yeah, I, I agree. Inconsistency. You know, no standardization in the tools from state to state. You know, no no standardized training, inconsistent training, lack of training completely. I think there's so many things that need to be polished and refined before we even get to where we can say, okay, this now we can look at it to dis, to see whether it works or not. Yeah. Well, the other thing is that the, the, the yeah, and the medical profession needs to turn a mirror on itself too. There's um, there's studies out there that indicate that in cases where people have sort of defied the odds. <laughs> that they actually have an advanced directive, um, that in overwhelming numbers of cases, the physician doesn't even know about it. So how can you possibly know whether or not the document is effective in implementation? If you don't know it's there, you're obviously not implementing it. So like that alone is evidence that we've got to do better. Right. I agree. I agree. So Nathan, if you could have the opportunity to sit down and talk one-on-one -on -one with someone who is actually facing a serious illness. What wisdom and guidance would you offer about having those advanced care planning discussions? I try to focus on character and values and not medicine. And the reason I say that is there's a lot of people who have create advanced directives that have like this giant, almost like a laundry list or a cookbook of things. If I have this, I want you to do that. If I have this, I want you to do that. I only want this for this many days and I want this and that and the next thing. What happens is they end up in an end of life situation, incapable of making decisions for themselves. And the thing that strikes them is not on their list. So you can sort of guess what they might want from all the other things that they, um, they've given you this laundry list about things but they haven't told me about what it means to be in love. What does it mean to be healthy? How important is dying in your house? Those kinds of things are fundamental to who that person is. And if I know those fundamentals, that gives me a lens to look at the specifics of their care situation and enables me to, to make a, a choice. So I don't want medical lingo in advanced directives, and I discourage it. Um, 
I also strongly discourage people from using superlatives in any sort of way. Always and never are terrible words for an advanced directive. They're usually overly broad and probably not what you actually intended. You're envisioning a situation that probably isn't going to be your situation, yet you say, I always or I never. And that's um, that's really, really problematic. So I, I like advanced directives where there are instructions to have some leeway and to say, here are my, here's what I conceive of from my position of, of relative health today as the type of thing that I would want, that I would want you to try for about this much time, but I'm not going to give you hard and fast rules. That's what I want people to focus on. That's just quality of life, Nathan. Yeah. That's what you're asking about. Who are you and what means quality of life for you? Yeah. And isn't that so much easier than trying to delve and d- decide, decipher all those medical terms and, and literally trying to create a list, you know, um, diagnosis specific directives. It's just not possible to predict all of that. There's no way. And, you know, a, a lot of the, the issue, too, is, you know, we, we know we should do this for ourselves, just the same as having a, a regular financial will, and so many people don't. But there's also, um, there's a lot of recognition by people that their loved ones are not going to live forever. Remember, we've got 100% mortality rate here. Um, and they don't want to talk about it. And so that becomes a challenge when an uh, aging parent is getting sicker and sicker and has a fall and has this and that. And people are reluctant to bring up the topic because they feel like it's, it's just going to upset them and things like that. And so in that situation, I recommend sort of flipping it around a little bit and trying to appeal to the individuals caring for their loved ones and say, mom, I don't want to upset you with this question, but you know, there may be a time when I have to make decisions for you. I love you so much. How can I honor you? How do I express my love for you if I have to make decisions? How can you not answer that question? Right. That's way different than going and saying, hey, mom, if you're unconscious, what do you want me to do? It's, all, it's so much of it is in the framing and making it a relational issue as opposed to a medical issue. Because isn't the decision making for someone else's care, isn't that a relational issue? Absolutely. It's a human issue. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So Nathan, when you have created and updated your own advanced care planning, what have you learned about yourself? Because this is an intensely personal discussion and plan. What have you learned about yourself from that doing your own? Man, I wasn't prepared for that. You have a grin on your face. Yeah, that was on um, the list, Nathan. Yeah, well, no, I think... Um, Probably the biggest learning uh, moment is just realizing the evolution of what the process and the forms are supposed to do. As I mentioned, when I started this whole thing, it was very document focused. It was, oh, if I give you some instructions, you'll know what to do because I've told you what to do. And I'm sort of envisioning the various life scenarios where that type of instruction was going to matter. And as I've gotten older... And I've had health adventures of my own and lived experience of all different types. I have seen the way in which um, decisions have to be made for me at times, for others at times, where I don't get to be a participant to the full extent because I'm having some sort of issue or a loved one is having an issue. And so moving from just a document with instructions to more of a conversation about who I am as an individual at the end of the day and the type of life that I lead today and would like to be, um, you know, carried through if I had the opportunity and when it's okay for me to say that situation, that condition of care, those drugs, those machines are far enough from sort of the narrative of who I've been my entire life. It's okay to let me go. And that's something that you just don't get to without thinking about it on a regular basis. And, you know, age makes it 
a little bit easier to have those conversations with others and talk about some of those things and where some of those, those guardrails are. But it's just, I think the evolution of my thinking has just been to make it broader and make it fuzzier in the best of ways. It's interesting. You would think it would be different that as you got older, especially working in healthcare ethics, that you would refine your focus. And yet you're saying, yeah, make it a little it. bit broader. Yeah, make it a little bit broader. Yeah, it's the furthest thing from it. And, and it, it goes back to my thinking and why it is that I, you know, if, if, if I'm trying to educate the world and I'm trying to use April 16, National Healthcare Decisions Day, as a way to bring people as close to my knowledge place as I can, I got to focus on the squishy stuff. Not on uh, not on the decisions stuff, not on the medical choices. And so that's the best thing I can do is bring that wisdom and that experience and try and share it with others and go from the evolution where I have been from advanced directives day to healthcare decisions day. I don't know what we're going to call it another five, you know, decade or so. Maybe the, the, the terms evolve even further, um, but it is a process. Absolutely. Okay. So Nathan, how can people be a part of National Healthcare Decisions Day in 2023? So it's April 16. I should mention that uh, the date is not an accident. It is the day after tax day. Thanks, Ben Franklin, for reminding us that nothing in life is certain but death and taxes. So that's how we came up with the date. There is no perfect date. So we just went with it. Um, But here's what you can do. First, you lead by example. You create your own advanced directive. You insist that the loved ones in your life do the same thing. And I know that for a lot of people, this this topic is really tough. I invite you to blame me. I'm the founder of this thing. You can say, I listen to this podcast. There's this guy named Nathan, and he invented this day. And I don't even know how to talk about this. It feels weird, <laughs> but he said I have to, so I'm doing it. So I'm now your excuse. I do that as a lawyer all the time. Just blame the lawyer. You can blame me and say, look, this is the, the designated day, just the same as you know, Breast Cancer Awareness Day or whatever. We're going to talk about it. No one's getting up from the dinner table until we've had a conversation about it. When you have had a conversation, please document it, name your agent, and then get out there and encourage other people to do the same. With social media, get that, get out on whatever your your um, social media might be and just say, hey, I just made decisions. Have you made them for yourself? And you don't have to share them with your Facebook community. Just say that you did it. The other thing that I strongly encourage folks to do is to reach out to particularly their religious organizations and say, can we can we have a discussion on this? Can we have a Bible study? Can we have a, a sermon on this? Because what you oftentimes find is that people will tell you that they are guided by their religious um, beliefs in end of life care. And then I, I, I ask them, all right, so when was the last time you actually talked about end of life decision making at your church, your synagogue, your mosque? And they'd give you a blank stare. So, well, how, how do you know? So where's your source of guidance? And so that's another one where I think people can reach out and say, I, I want this topic. Can we, can we do something? So that's another way to do it. And then on the provider side, you know, go through your protocols. Look at what your admissions process looks like. Are you asking the question in a meaningful way that will actually elicit responses that can do something to improve care? Um, the other thing, lead by example, uh, providers. You know, providers are frankly, no better than the the rest of the public in terms of having advanced directives of of their own. You can't be a good advocate. You can't be good at asking the question if you haven't wrestled with it yourself. It doesn't mean that you're going to come up with the same types of answers as your patient might. But if you haven't had to wrestle with which of my three children decision maker when they're spread around the country and I get along with one but not the other, you can't do your job well if you haven't wrestled with that yourself. So those are multiple ways that 
people can engage and institutions can engage in National Healthcare Decisions Day. I love it. I love it. I'll have links in the show notes to the NHDD website and to the Conversation Project, which partners to provide National Healthcare Decisions Day. Nathan, you are such a, a great advocate, a great voice in this arena. We're so grateful to have you advocating for these advanced care plan discussions. Thank you so much for talking to me today. Thanks for having us. I, I appreciate you helping to spread the word. Like I said, I could have talked to Nathan for another hour. There's a lot to unpack when it comes to advanced care planning for not for patients, but for people, but for people. And I think that is Nathan's perspective. These are people talking about who they are, what's important to them. It's not just about that document. It's about the conversation. It's about the planning. So if you think about advanced care planning, advanced means you, you're doing it prior to the need, which of course is a huge benefit. I've seen so many families that are making decisions on the fly in a moment of crisis when they're exhausted and sad and grieving and scared and sleep deprived. That's not a great way to make a decision, especially when it comes to the health needs of someone else, someone you care about. But there has to be a conversation, hopefully between the person and their proxy or their medical power of attorney. And it has to be more encompassing than just the healthcare decisions. Nathan touched on this. You know, there, there are various aspects. Where do you want to be when you die? Who do you want to take care of you? And of course, we know that there are also other things about funeral arrangements, memorial arrangements, um, human decomposition, different things that people need to talk about. Those decisions need to be discussed and documented. So important. One of the things that he focused on that I really want to highlight is talking about if you have the right decision maker, they will make the right decisions. If you have the right decision maker, they will make the right decisions. Someone who knows you, has your best interest at heart, will put your wishes ahead of what they would do or what they believe. I, I, I think I could probably end the podcast right there. If you have the right decision maker, he will make the right decision. We need advanced care plans because we're human, not because we have risky behaviors or there's a potential for an illness, a chronic illness, a genetic illness, but because we're human. We need to encourage people to focus on values and personality instead of healthcare decisions. Like Nathan said, it's a relational issue. It's a human issue, not a medical issue. Be sure to catch the next episode of the Heart of Hospice podcast. You can find more episodes on theheartofhospice.com. And don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. You can connect with the Heart of Hospice on Facebook and Instagram and send your questions or comments by email to helen at theheartofhospice.com. And remember, no matter who you are or where you are in your hospice journey, you are the heart of hospice. This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time.